Hi, uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for uh, coming to our uh, seminar, uh, bi-weekly seminar. And it's a pleasure to have today uh, Dr. Kubler from Indiana University. Dr. Kubler is an assistant professor and the director of computational linguistics in the Department of Linguistics at IU. Uh, she holds a PhD in computational linguistics from University of Tübingen, Tübingen, sorry, and an MA from the University of Trier. In, uh, both in Germany, and uh, she also spent uh, time at the University of Tübingen and the University of Duisburg prior to coming to IU. Her main interests are in dependency, parsing, parsing of morphological rich languages, and machine learning for computational linguistics problems. She's also interested in integrating linguistics information and machine learning methods in computational linguistics. It's a pleasure to have her here. Thank you for coming. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. And um, if I put you to sleep, I apologize in advance. Um, <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about computational linguistics slash natural language processing. So um, we have several different names for the field. Um, and then depending on, on who you ask, um, you get different answers of what that means and, and what we should be called. Um, I'm interested in, in mostly in, in multilingual settings on German, so it's kind of natural that I do a lot of my research on German, and it turns out to be a lot more challenging than doing it in English for some reasons. And I'll try to show you some of the reasons today. Um, I wanted to start out with a definition of natural language processing to give you at least an idea of what this is. Um, this is something that I stole from Wikipedia. So thank God for Wikipedia because um, all the definitions you find in textbooks um, don't tell you anything, basically. Um, so it's, it's a field somewhere between computer science and linguistics, um, and it tries to make the computer understand language, basically. Um, it's sometimes, I like this part, referred to as an AI complete problem because um, natural language recognition seems to uh, require a lot of knowledge not only about the language, but also about the outside world and the ability to manipulate it, as we will hopefully see. Um, it has a significant overlap with the field of computational linguistics. <laughs> I think they're, they're basically these two terms are synonymous, um, but yeah. Um, and it's often considered a subfield of artificial intelligence. Um, a lot of, of what we do these days um, is Grounded in machine learning, especially in statistical um, approaches, um, we're only users normally. So whatever computer scientists come up with, we use, and then complain that it doesn't work for us normally. Um, research in computational linguistics and natural language processing, no matter what you want to call it, um, is always somewhere located between different fields. Um, so we're really interdisciplinary. Um, so we're somewhere between linguistics, computer science, and statistics. And if you look at the definition for computational linguistics, it's fairly similar, um, but it lists a lot more fields. So we're somewhere um, with linguists, computer scientists, experts in artificial intelligence, mathematicians, logicians, philosophers, cognitive scientists, cognitive psychologists, psycholinguists, anthropologists, and neuroscientists, and many, many. <laughs> I didn't say we get along. <laughs> we just talk to them. Um, and a lot of times it would be helpful to have people working in that. Um, we talked over lunch about how syntactic representations are stored in the brain. And I, I have to say, I don't know. And um, there are psycholinguists basically working on that, but um, I think they have the wrong approach because they say, this is my grammar theory and this is what people do with it. I think that's the wrong approach because we have no clue if this grammar theory is really anywhere close to what we do in our brains. Um, so I think they have the wrong question to start over. Um, so much for getting along. <laughs> um, OK, short history. In the 1950s, we had the Cold War, so everybody was interested in seeing what the, the enemy is doing. So everybody wanted to know what is being published in Russian or what is being published in English. Um, and that means machine translation can be really helpful. Um, in the 60s, I keep saying that Chomsky happened. At the beginning, I guess that was a good idea because he came up with a lot of new ideas, new theories. Uh, but then he said something like, there is no statistics in language. 
and, and this was basically, basically the end of our field <laughs> for a long time. Um, in, in 64, the ALPAC report happened. Um, there was a report that said machine translation is probably not possible, at least not with the knowledge that we have at that point. So we recommend basic research. We do not recommend funding machine translation. So that was really the end of the field for a long time. Um, and then if you do artificial intelligence, you know all about ELISA and Schulu, I guess. In the 1980s, the field picked up again. And then people did these knowledge-based systems. So um, they had a lot of toy grammars, a lot of toy systems that could deal with 10 sentences. And then a lot of people said, problem solved. Let's move on to the next one. Yep, unfortunately, it didn't work that way. Um, because whenever people try to scale up, so instead of analyzing 10 sentences, go to a newspaper and try to analyze even one article in there, um, turn out that you have to do a lot more and all of a sudden your ambiguity, the different analysis that you get, explode. So um, you don't only get, if I look at a parser today, it's my syntactic analysis, if I have a standard sentence that I would say has one meaning, I don't only get one analysis, I get millions of analysis. Just because I'm, I'm extracting rules from a grammar that's based on 40,000 sentences that some poor students had to annotate. Um, so what we need is, is really statistical and machine learning approaches to find out what the best analysis are. Okay, a um, little bit more about knowledge-based NLP um, because there's still a lot of lessons we can learn from that. Um, basically, but then it was a proof of concept. So you had these tiny toy grammars. Um, you had manually written rules. Um, and that developed into a lot of complicated linguistic formalisms. If you're interested, ask me later. Um, otherwise, I'll skip that. Um, there was a lot of work on, on, on logic paradigms. Um, but it turned out that this is not robust enough, so it doesn't scale up. Um, and there were only a few applications around. Then we, we stole uh, machine learning, basically, from the computer scientists. Um, because we decided we don't want to write these rules anymore. Um, we want to have the machine learn the rules automatically. Um, and that means we have this massive ambiguity problem. Um, we don't get one analysis, we get millions. Um, so we need annotated data for training. Uh, we still do a lot of supervised training because unsupervised doesn't get us anywhere. Um, every linguist who looks at the unsupervised approaches knows, what's that? That doesn't look like any linguistic thingy whatsoever, so we can't use that. Um, we're trying to get into mildly supervised approaches, um, but we haven't gotten very far there. A um, few NLP applications, in case you're not familiar with those. I guess by now everybody is using spell checking um, in Word or whatever. Um, I'm, normally, I'm annoyed when I get the grammar checker um, in Word. The, the green squiggle, so I, it's just plain annoying, I think. <laughs> Um, but that's an application. Um, then there's speech recognition, um, which we computational linguists normally don't do. Um, you need engineers, electrical engineers for that for some reason. Um, normally, people say, once you fire a linguist, um, your system gets better. <laughs> so um, normally we're not involved in that. But we do do dialogue systems. So if you ever had a conversation with a computer, if you booked an airline ticket or whatever, that's what we do. Don't hold me responsible, though. Um, we do machine translation, and I'll show you examples later on of that. Um, there's also translation memories, which was a fairly simplistic idea of how to do translation more reliably than um, statistical machine translation, um, where you just, I mean, if you have a company, you normally translate the same thing over and over again, or very similar things. So instead of having um, a system that goes off in, in any kind of direction, any point. Um, just use whatever you have as the basis and then look for the, the most similar thing that you can find and just piece them together. That's called translation memories. Um, we also do text summarization. Wouldn't that be great? Um, as an undergrad, if you had to summarize a book and you just give it to your machine and say, give me, I don't know, 500 words, give me 1,000 words. We're working on that, but at the moment it's more like um, my former boss used to call that um, sentence selection. Because basically what text summarization does at the moment is it selects the most important sentences in a text and just pieces them together. Um, there's also information retrieval and extraction, and then there's question answering. This is what Google does if you ask it a question. Maybe you get a reply, maybe you don't. Um, who knows? 
Um, a little bit about machine translation. So I wanted to talk about uh, machine translation and then a little bit more about two areas in which, where I'm involved in, um, parsing, so syntactic analysis, and a little bit of core reference resolution. In machine translation, I had some experience. I worked on one of these big German projects called Verbmobile. Still have nightmares about that. Um, theoretically, in, in machine translation, you, you can have two different approaches. Um, you can have deep linguistic processing, so you put a lot of information in there, you analyze your, um, your source language, and then try to convert that into your target language, and then generate the sentence in the target language. Or you can have a statistical approach where you just give it a lot of translated text, and it figures out this word corresponds to that word, and that word corresponds to this word, and it may be right, it may be wrong too. Um, sometimes you get really interesting translations that way. Um, there are a few pretty well-known systems Promethio is one of the success stories in the field. Um, stories in the field. That was in Canada, um, where they had to um, publish their, their weather forecasts, or um, have them on the radio as in, in English and in French, because they had the two official languages. So they had these poor translators sitting there translating weather forecasts. I mean, how much variation do, do you get in a weather forecast? Maybe 60 degrees, maybe 80 degrees, but it, it's always about you know, sunny, cloudy, rainy, maybe some snow. Um, so it, that was really boring, and they lost their translators, uh, I, I guess, one every three months or so. Um, so they said, we need an, an automatic system to do that. And since it's a very close domain, you don't have that much, much variation in there. Um, that actually worked fairly well. And then they have the humans still there to correct whatever the system outputs. And after they introduced the system, people stayed for three years or longer. Um, so that's considered a success. Um, then there was Fistran, which is now Babelfish. Um, there was Wordmobile, which um, kept a lot of unemployed uh, NLP workers um, employed for a long time. And then there's Google Translate. I don't know. Um, has everybody tried out Google Translate? Do you have experience with that? What's your experience? How many people are happy with the translations? <laughs> Sometimes? It, I guess it, it depends on whether you translate into English or from English to another language. And then it also depends on the language that you trans sorry, translate into. Chinese works fairly well, I was told. I don't speak any Chinese, so I can't really tell. If you translate into German, you get some interesting results. Um, if you translate into Arabic, don't go there. Um, my favorite machine translation web page is this one. Um, it's based on, on Babelfish, and it translates from English into one language, and then back to English, and then into another language, back to English. You can see the results. I'm not going to the web page because sometimes it can be very slow to load. So I did some of the examples. Um, I tried the first sentence, the girl ate cherries, and then she bought a cake. Um, for those of you who speak some French, um, I think the French still looks okay. Um, and then, if you translate back to English, uh, all of a sudden it doesn't know what gender the girl is, so it, it, she turns into an it. Um, in, actually, actually in German, it, it, the sentence looks perfect, but on, on the way back, um, it moves for some reason. I haven't figured out why that happened. Um, <laughs> and then from there on, um, it, it gets really interesting. Um, so you can see that you can translate cherries from English into Italian, into ciliace, but on the way back, um, it does not seem to know what ciliace means, so it, it just copies the word into English. And then um, I guess if you try to translate an, a theoretically English word, which is really Italian, uh, into Portuguese, you can't really expect it um, to do that right. Um, so a lot of information is missing here, and, and the information that's missing in this case, um, where it started to go wrong, was when it translated back from French into English, and said the, the, the she turned into an it. Um, that was because it didn't know what the she referred to, or the it referred to, or the L in that case. Um, so this is co-reference resolution, and we'll talk about that. Next one. Um, this is something that I tried on, on Google, and I got a very um, poetic 
translation in, from hill, of hill climbing search in, into German. Um, this one is interesting too. Um, search rising hill um, is kind of interesting. So um, these known compounds, hill climbing search, um, can be really difficult to translate. Um, <laughs> I like the German. Steigender Hügel der Recherche. But in this example, people who have you know a scientific type of background are much more likely to understand what's going on. But if you would, if you would this, give this you know to a lay person, they might also make mistakes in how they understand. Yes, but I think the, the mistakes would be of a different kind. So this is why we look at these examples and say, what, what, what is the machine doing there? I don't understand what's happening there because we wouldn't make these kinds of mistakes. Um, I mean, I, I know that there's no hill of the research. Um, you, you can't say that. Um, but if you want to have fun with it, play with it, um, sometimes you get really interesting results. It's constantly being updated, so uh, it's always the latest version of Babelfish that's used. Um, at some point, um, I think it, it, didn't, it couldn't translate computer back from, from French into English, so every time you had a computer in, in, in the sentence, um, you get some interesting results. I think it translated back as ghost for some reason. Um, so, and as, as we can see here, and, and there's lots more examples, um, if you have a language that has a lot of forms for words, not like English, you say English has an impoverished morphology. So um, if you think about that, how many forms of nouns can you have? Well, there's a singular and there's a plural with the S, um, and, and that's normally it. If you think about verbs, you have um, place form, you have third person singular with the S, and then you have an, a gerund form, and you may have a past form, and then that's about it. Um, in other languages, you have a lot more forms, and then um, this gets a lot more complicated, and that also means that um, machine translation applications have a lot more problems finding out what the correct form of the word is. It's kind of um, understandable. I mean, if you have only so much training text, and you find out that this word corresponds to that word uh, statistically, how do you know what the correct form of this word in that context is? I don't think we will ever have enough training data to figure that out this way. So um, I think we have to put in a lot more linguistic knowledge to get that right. Um, unfortunately, I'm, of, I'm one of the very few people who believe that. If you talk to the people at Google who do the translation system, they just say, we need more data, that's all. Um, talking about linguistic levels, um, this, this is normally the, the types of analysis that we do. We start out with phonetics. Phonology, this is about the sounds. Then morphology is about the parts of the words and, and the endings and the forms that a word can take. Um, then we have parts of speech, which are word classes. So this is talking about verbs and nouns and adjectives and all the rest that we don't want to talk about. Um, then we have syntax, and I'll show you some examples on, of that. Um, I have lexical semantics on there. Lexical semantics is basically trying to find out what a word means. Um, some words have more than one meaning, um, like a bill. You can have a bill in a restaurant. You can also have a bill in a, a certain birds. And they're really two different things. Um, so if you want to translate that, you should know which one you're talking about. Because in your target language, there may be two different words for that. And if you choose the wrong one, um, you may get something pretty funny. But um, it, it probably won't help you communicate properly. Um, there's more to semantics, to meaning, than just word meaning. Um, unfortunately, we haven't really figured out how to do the rest, so I'm, I'm not going to talk about that. Um, and then there's discourse meaning. So this is where co-reference comes in. Um, what does he, she, it refer to previous in the text? Um, and you have to know that because in other languages, it, it works differently. So you have to know um, what the word is that this one really replaces in order to get it right in, in your target language. Um, when we do the analysis, we do morphology is normally done with finite state methods. So this is still rule-based. Um, and we know all about finite state because computer science did a lot of work on that, so that's fine. And it, it's fairly fast and efficient, so that's good too. Um, we do part of speech tagging, so we can assign parts of speech, like verb, noun, adjective, whatever, to, to um, words. For English, that works fairly well. Um, we have an accuracy rate of about I know 97%. So um, that's fairly okay. If you go to other languages, if you do that for Arabic, um, your parts of speech are somewhere in the area of 
about a thousand maybe. Um, and that's a lot more difficult than just getting the 36 right that we have for English. Um, so there it's a lot harder and, and you get lower accuracy. You can do parsing and we use um, whatever computer science use for compilers, we decided to use for language. And we found out it doesn't really work all that well because we have a lot more ambiguity in there. I mean, yeah, programming languages are not supposed to be used. Um, the computer is not supposed to guess what you mean. Um, so if you go to language and, and use the same techniques, um, you run into problems. So we need statistics there. We do word census ambiguation, so we figure out what bank means. Is it the financial institution? Um, is it the Riverside Bank or is it the plane movement? Um, we do, we can detect selectional restrictions of verbs. Um, so if you think about the verbs kill, murder, and assassinate, what's the difference there? Um, in order to kill, the, the thing to be killed has to be animate. It has to be living, otherwise you can't really kill it. Well, I guess you can kill your engine, but that's a different story. Um, if you murder something, somebody, it has to be somebody, right? It has to be a person. If you want to assassinate somebody, it's not only a person, it has to be a person of certain influence, um, a well-known person. Um, and we, we can learn that kind of thing somehow. Um, we can also do a little bit of shallow inference these days. And this is really important because um, we all know that if X killed Y, then Y is dead. Um, unfortunately, my computer doesn't know that. So I have to tell the computer this somehow. Um, that if you find in the text that Y is, was killed, um, and the question is, is Y dead, then you can say yes. Um, and we do an Afra co-reference resolution, so we try to figure out what easy it refers to. Sometimes you also find noun phrase um, pairs, and I'll have an example of that later on. We borrowed a lot of concepts from computer science. Um, I won't go through that, with that one. Parsing. <laughs> um, so this is basically what we want to get out. This is the first sentence of the one corpus um, of the one text collection we have that's annotated syntactically. I think Pierre Finken is the most well-known guy in, co in computational linguistics, and he probably doesn't even know about that um, because this is the first sentence, so everybody always cites it. Um, and as you can see, uh, we want to have kind of a tree structure. So I, I know it's hard to see. Um, where we say the whole thing is a sentence, and then we have a noun phrase, Pierre Finken, 61 years old, um, which again consists of a noun phrase, Pierre Finken, and an adjectival phrase. Um, and the whole noun phrase is the subject of the sentence, and um, then we have the verb phrase and whatever. So it's structural learning, what we're doing here. Um, an Afghan co reference resolution looks like that. Um, for text like this one that we have here, um, all the blue things can potentially refer to something previous in the text. Um, and if you look at the first she, that refers back to Sophia Loren. Um, and then we have Bono. The actress then refers back to Sophia Loren. The U2 finger is, refers back to Bono, which is clear to us. But how does the computer know that? Um, we can actually teach it to do fairly well on that task um, for English. Um, so parsing. We, again, we, as I said, we borrowed concepts from computer science. We do bottom-up parsing. We start with the words and try to put them together in, into bits and pieces um, that we call constituents. Um, we use standard chart parser. So if you've done computer science um, compiler construction, it should sound familiar. But we have to have an, a, a probabilistic approach on top of that. So I want to get the most likely analysis, not only the million analyses that are possible. Um, the grammar and the probabilities are extracted from a tree bank. A tree bank is a collection of sentences that poor students have annotated. Um, and for English, we have one tree bank based on the Wall Street Journal. So we know how to parse financial text. We're really great at that. Um, we can't parse anything else, unfortunately. Um, a friend of mine called that, called parsing the Wall Street Journal science, um, because that's all we do. Um, I want to do something else. I want to parse German. And why? Well, first of all, it, it's really interesting because we have actually two different tree banks. Um, and they have different annotations. So will have one type of syntactic annotation on, in the one tree bank and another one in the other tree bank. Um, it, it has more morphology than English. We have a case system in German. 
um, which means that you can move things around a lot more easily than in English. Um, and that also means that uh, you always have to guess where your subject is. Um, don't want to go into details here. Ask me later if you're interested. Okay, so where are we in parsing? Um, I'm, I'm sorry, um, I only have numbers for you. I don't have any nice pictures. Um, computational linguists normally insist on numbers, so that's what you get. Um, we evaluate parsing using precision recall. Precision, how many of the nodes that I wanted to get did I get? No, how many of the ones I got are correct? Um, recall how many of the ones that I wanted to get did I get? And the f-score is the harmonic mean of that. Um, if you look at that, if you look at English, it, it doesn't look that bad. Um, by now, we have more advanced ones, so we're in the low 90s. But remember, this is based on nodes in my tree. So it's, it's not the number of sentences that are completely correct. If you look at complete correctness, you're somewhere in the 30s. Um, frustrating. But then, um, if you go to German, the numbers that we had, that we still have, actually, are a lot lower. Um, and we can also see, um, it's not really important, um, if you use lexical information, for English, normally parsing gets better, and German gets worse. Yeah? Uh, how do you apply the ground truth here? How do you compare these against the manual tagging? Yes. Okay. So this is the tree bank. So some poor students had to sit down and annotate those tree stars. And we compare against that. Um, you can also see that for the two different tree banks that we have in German, there's a huge difference in F scores. And I was interested in why is that? Um, I'm showing you a tree. This, this is a German tree, so don't look too closely. Um, just look at the overall structure. You have a lot of nodes, you will notice. The wrong things. If you look at the other tree bank, um, that's a lot flatter. Unfortunately, it also has crossing branches. As you can see, yep. Where am I? This one. Nope, that's the previous thing. This one here. Sorry. Um, you see that this one crosses here. This is something we cannot deal with in, in parsing. This is something that, that linguists want to annotate, but the parser cannot deal with it. If we had a parser um, that parses these structures, it would be super inefficient. I mean, this is inefficient enough. Um, we still have, we're talking about hours to parse a couple of thousand sentences. Um, so if you want to have these crossing branches, forget about it. And, and the error rates are even higher. Um, so this is no way to go. What we normally do is we flatten out the tree so we don't have any crossing branches anymore, which I think in, um, introduces inconsistencies in the annotation, which makes it harder for the parser to learn. So if we just compare the two tree banks, this is what we get. Um, and the first thing that I want to look at are the labeled F-score numbers. Um, the upper ones are not really interesting. In Germany, you have to look at the functions too. So you want to know that something is a subject or a direct object because you cannot tell from the word order what it is like you could in English. Um, so the lower numbers are actually more important. And there's a huge difference there. It's even bigger than with the, the parser we've seen before because this one is less intelligent. Um, uh, what we also see is that the second tree bank has a lot more nodes per word. So it has a lot more structure on top. And that seems to make it easier for um, the parser to get it right. Um, but it, it, it's really frustrating just to sit there and, and look at the numbers and not know what's happening there. So I wanted to know why exactly is that. And I had a colleague um, saying that I want to know how good the parsers are on, let's say, noun phrases. Noun phrases are a thing that a lot of applications can use. Like information retrieval is mostly interested in noun phrases. They don't care about the verbs. Um, so if you could get noun phrases right um, a lot of times, then we had something that some, somebody could use. Um, but then we said, huh, we can't really compare that. Because a noun phrase in the one tree bank means something different from a noun phrase in, in the other tree bank. Um, one of them has a noun phrase that consists of one word, like this, or that, or he. The other one doesn't. So comparing that would be comparing apples and oranges. Um, so my idea was, why don't we try to make one tree bank more similar to the other? Like delete all the stuff that the other one doesn't have and, and see what happens there. So I deleted all the, the nodes 
in, in, the one, in, in the high up tree bank um, that cover just one word. Um, I flattened the phrases in, in the, the one with more structure so that it closely resembles the one with less structure. And then for the other one, the, the, the flat one, I tried to introduce certain structure in, in the text. Um, if you do that, these are the numbers. Um, what you should see is that in the first two columns, if I introduce the field information, the more structure into the flat one, it gets better. So the field information seems to help. Or maybe it's just because it's more nodes, I don't know. But it's probably not the case. Um, if you take away structure from, from the one that has more structure to, be, to begin with, um, you get fairly close to the one without structure. So if you look at this number here and that number here, they're a lot closer than, um, than this one. So taking away the structure means that it, it's a lot harder to parse this. And the same happens um, with, um, when you look at the functional, oops, um, at the functional representation. Um, problems with the whole thing is, after I started that, that work, um, other people picked up on it and, and tried to run similar experiments. And there's one um, paper by Ines Reban and Josef van Genabit who did similar experiments, but they had different results. Um, we're still trying to figure out what really is going on. Um, they had a different evaluation set. Um, they had restricted their sentences to length, I think, 15 at most. I think that has some influence because mine, my evaluation was done in sentences up to length 40 or so. Um, and, and they tend to be more complex if they get longer. So that may have some influence. Um, it also turns out what we didn't know before is that the evaluation metric that we use favors trees with a lot of nodes. Because then if you get one wrong, um, it's not that bad. If you have, I don't know, one out of 40 wrong, it's not that bad. If you have one out of 20 wrong, it's a lot worse. Um, so they suggested that we should evaluate on, on dependencies on another structure that has exactly one, one kind of type of information per word, um, which kind of levels out the, the differences between the structures. Um, the problem with that is the conversion is lossy too, so we lose in converting to this representation, um, which means we don't really know what happens there. So we're still working on that. And I'm switching topics. I'm going to co reference the solution now. Um, here I marked everything that's blue refers to Sophia Loren. Everything that's marked in red um, refers to Bono. And um, the green and, and the yellow stuff um, are separate. Um, they don't refer back to anything else. So this is what we want to learn from the text. I'm not going to tell you how this works. Um, if you want to find out, come to my seminars. <laughs> um, the interesting thing we did here is that we tried to do that in a multilingual setting. So this is the first time that somebody tried to do that, not in English. There was one, I think, one paper on German before. Um, but we tried to cover a whole range of languages. This wasn't a shared task um, at a workshop last year. So they, they made the data available, which is really nice. Um, normally what you have to do is find the, the colorful phrases up here first. So everything that's marked in a, in a color is so-called markable, can potentially refer to something previously. Um, and then we classify pairs of these markables, whether they're correct or not. So if you have two blue ones, the, the classifier should say yes. If you have a blue one and a red one, it should say no. Um, and then afterwards, you have to make a decision um, if you have conflicting information, how to resolve that. Um, our goal and, and the whole thing was to figure out if we can find methods that work not only for one language, but fairly robustly over all the languages that we have. Um, so this is the system. I'll skip that. Um, basically, here we have um, finding the, the blue stuff, and the green stuff, and the yellow stuff, and the red stuff. Um, then we have to extract information from those. Um, we have, in this case, a memory-based classifier, k-nearest neighbor classifier. Um, and then we have a, um, so this is where we do the classification and this is where we, we make the final um, decisions to clean up data that's contradictory. Um, 
we, at the first, we concentrated on marketable extraction because that's something that nobody has done before. Uh, normally, people expect that you have the marketables already. They come from annotated in the text. And this is the first task that didn't have that. Um, so we, we tried different methods of extracting information. One is based on, on parts of speech. So this is a noun, this is a verb. Um, and you can say that every time I find a noun, everything that, that's, or if, you, if I have the annotation in the training data, that this is my noun and this all belongs to the noun, then I know this is my markable. Um, you can also do that based on a syntactic annotation. These are dependencies here, um, where you find whatever makes the head of the noun phrase, whatever goes in there, and then all the dependents can be um, markables too. And then um, we also tried um, a classifier um, that we trained on, on the training data just to say, yes, this is inside a markable, no, this is not inside a markable, um, and then we have to distinguish between the beginning of a markable and the end of a markable. It's a little more complicated because the markables unfortunately can be nested. We can have one markable inside another. Um, so just saying, this is the beginning of a markable, this is the end of a, or this is outside a markable, and, and this somewhere in a markable is not enough. The, the labels are a little more complicated. Um, if we do that on all my languages, sorry, it's a lot of numbers, I know that. Um, the ones that are marked in red are the best results for that language. So um, you can see that they have a tendency to cluster in these two columns. So using dependency annotation, using syntactic information to find your markables seems to work best for most languages. The only exceptions are Dutch and German, um, where the machine learning approach for some reason works better. Um, we're still looking at the data to figure out why this is the case. Maybe it's the language, because I mean, they're, they're fairly closely related. So that could be one thing. Um, maybe it's something else. Um, then we decided, OK. And now we know what the best markable extractor is. What happens if we put that in the whole co-reference resolution setting? Um, we did that. And I was so frustrated when I saw the numbers. I have no clue what's going on here. Um, first of all, what I have to explain is that, again, these are my three methods. This is based on part of speech information. This is based on syntactic information. And this is the classifier. Um, and these are my languages again. We have Catalan, Dutch, English, German, Italian, and Spanish. And these here are the different metrics that I use to evaluate co-reference resolution. So one of the problems in the field is that people cannot even decide which one metric is the best. They're basically all crappy. But they're all that we have, so I shouldn't complain too loudly about those. Um, but the frustrating part here is that if you look at the numbers, again, the red ones are the best or the language and evaluation metric. Um, you can see that sometimes um, different methods work best for different metrics, or diff combinations of metrics and languages. Um, and you can also see that um, in contrast to the table I showed you before, um, these are all over the place, basically. So this time, I even have um, my weakest method so far, the, the one based on parts of speech, performs best for Italian um, for certain metrics up here. Um, then this one was, uh, the DS one was the best one overall. Um, and it's still fairly strong, but mostly for, um, for MUC and maybe BQ. Um, for the other two, um, it, it looks like that um, the classifier seems to work better, actually. Um, and for, again, for Dutch and for German, um, mostly the classifier works best. So that's continuing on. Um, we know that for these two languages, the classifier works best if we evaluate just on microballs, and it works best if we just evaluate on co-reference. But if we look at the other languages, the results are a lot more diverse. Um, so what does that mean? For us, that means um, the markable evaluation and the co-reference evaluation are contradictory. Meaning, if I just, if I look at my different methods and just evaluate based on how good my markables are, how, how good the, the, the colorful parts are in the, the, the text that I showed you, um, that's not good enough. 
I have to run everything through the whole reference resolution system to figure out what works best in the overall system. That's a huge overhead that I have if, if I have to do that for every method I come up with in all these languages. Um, luckily, I didn't have to do that. Um, the student that I mentioned on the slides, um, Desi, is doing all the experiments. And um, she's running experiments like crazy. Um, it, and it takes a long time to run them on all the six languages. Um, and, and she didn't even optimize the classifier, which normally is a big no-no. You can't just use the default settings. Um, we all know that. Um, but if you run out of time, then this is what you have to do. So she played around with it a little bit, figured out it doesn't really help all that much, so we'll, we'll just use the default settings. Um, the evaluation based on the different methods, uh, sorry, based on the different evaluation metrics is contradictory. So again, um, if there's more shared tasks, we first have to see which evaluation metric are they using um, to figure out which method we should use to get the best results. That's frustrating. <laughs> or if they use all of them um, and maybe take the average of that, then uh, what, what are we going to do? Um, that means we really have to try everything. Um, and we have no idea uh, what the influence on that is and, and why some of the methods work better with different metrics and, and why um, they're so inconsistent. Um, I think one of the problems is that the annotation in itself, I mean, we have six languages, but we have six different annotations. And what in the one language um, counts as coreferent does not necessarily count as coreferent in the other language. Um, so there's, there's inconsistency in there. Um, and sometimes, for some languages, the annotators decided to use syntactic constituents as their basis. Um, that should normally mean if you have a syntactic methods to find them, you should do better. But I know that for German, this was exactly the case. They first had the syntactic annotation, and then they put the coreference annotation on top of that. So everything that's marked as, as constituent in the syntax um, gets directly translated into um, a markable. But it's still, for German, um, the classifier actually worked better than, than the syntactic method. Um, and then sometimes I think even within the language, some of them are more cleanly annotated. I mean, we all know we're human, um, and we all know that we make mistakes, especially when you have such a boring task of annotating just with respect to that, um, that we do make mistakes. And um, the students get paid the big bucks, right? <laughs> um, so some of them are annotated more cleanly, some people pay. I don't know, paid the students more or paid more students to annotate the same thing over again. Because then if you have three different annotations of one sentence, if they don't agree, then you know you have to look more closely. Some other languages probably didn't have the funds for that, so um, there's more errors in, in that. And that really screws up the machine learning um, approach because um, if there's inconsisten inconsistencies in the training data, there's no way you can learn what you're supposed to learn. Um, for us, the big question is, does it make sense to try to have methods that work across all different languages, or does it make a lot more sense to introduce language-specific information, language-specific heuristics? Uh, we would like to stay um, as language-independent as possible. Um, but at the moment, we get punished for that because um, all the other systems that took part in, in this shared task they, you know, I think there was one also that submitted results for all the different languages, but all the other systems submitted results for one, maybe two languages. So they spend a lot of time optimizing the system for this specific language, um, which wasn't really the, the goal, but um, yeah. um, we haven't figured out that question yet. So um, I think I'm going to conclude here. So far, Natural language processing is mostly focused in English, unfortunately. And sometimes it's hard to get papers into conferences um, when you work on languages other than English. I had one paper rejected um, where the only criticism was, this is on Arabic, who cares? Um, keep telling the story, but it, it's true, unfortunately, I can show you the review. Um, and the, the problem with that is English is really rather atypical for, for the, the width of languages out there. Um, English has a fixed word order, and it doesn't have a lot of different forms. It doesn't have a lot of different morphology. Um, so if you take the methods that were developed for English and use them for other languages, you lose a lot of accuracy. 
um, just because the other languages are so different and may need different strategies to figure out how to do them. Uh, unfortunately, there isn't a lot of money these days in, in developing syntactic analysis or co-reference analysis for Arabic, Italian, um, Bambara, whatever. Um, so I think we should figure out methods that are more robust towards all the different languages that are out there, um, which is a huge challenge. Um, multilingual NLP is becoming more important, um, but I guess we still have a long way to go. So I hope I got you a little bit interested. Um, I don't see anyone sleeping, so I guess I succeeded with my talk. Thanks for your patience. You talked about the text summarization application, right? Mm -hmm. So is there any work being done on text elaboration, like given a small, compact, and complex paragraph, the application is to explain it in a long time? Not necessarily. There are some approaches to simplification. So um, you have people with aphasia, for example, who cannot understand certain syntactic instructions. So, um, there's a certain type of aphasia where people have a hard time understanding passive sentences or relative clauses because that, that gets too complex and they can't process it. So there are applications trying to take such sentences and take, um, convert them into active sentences or take out the relative clause and make a separate sentence out of them. The, the languages you're looking at of a structure, you know, both spoken and written, right? What about languages that are just spoken? There's no written equivalent. Yes, languages that are just spoken are really, really hard. Um, I guess you, you, you could always do um, I don't know, speech recognition and then say we work on the text. But even if you do that for English, um, we lose a lot. Um, so we don't know enough about processing even transliterated English. So if you have a dialogue and, and, and somebody writes it down or you have a speech recognition system giving you text that was supposedly spoken, um, we don't know how to process that, that kind of data. So I think we had, we'd have to figure that one first and then maybe we can don't have a written form. Into Scotland and tried to translate the language that was natural to the people. Mm -hmm. It looks terrible. <laughs> yeah, I guess we also have to get away from, um, a lot of us linguists have a prescriptive bias, so we want to tell people how to use the language. So is your tree, if you, if you prune your tree, have you seen how much you lose in, the, in, the, in your figures, your performance figures? Have you tried that? You prune the tree. Yes. The tree can keep growing. Um, but my, my tree is my analysis. Yeah. So if I if I actually prune the tree, then I make the linguists unhappy because they say then the tree doesn't have any meaning anymore. Um, I did that a little bit in, in this one experiment where I showed the big table, where I took away structure. It, it was not really pruning. Um, it was more specialized. It took only a certain type of information away, and that actually helps. So the question is, does it help because um, it's, it's, it's just information that, that prevents the parser from getting it right, or is it information that's just missing afterwards when I try to figure out what, what well, this means? information is very little used. Yeah. The tree grows and stuff in the bottom usually not very important. Well, the stuff at the bottom are the words that are important in that case. Um, yeah, there, there are things in the, the tree that may not be that important, and we may be able to do away with them. It's just hard to figure out what these parts are, because, I mean, if I present this work to my colleagues, um, they have a tendency to say, oh well, yeah, but you're catering towards your parser, and who knows what the parser in 20 years will look like. Well, I keep arguing that my parser, the parsers that we're using, it's the same technology that has been used, I don't know, 50 years ago. The only thing that changed is the probability model on top of that, and that doesn't change all that much. Um, so I think we have to.
figure out what is important in these annotations and what is not, and what influence that has on parsing, um, I just have to convince my colleagues that that's really the way to go. <laughs> yeah. You have a system where you basically, you have a structure that you expect from a language, and then you, you might add some structure that isn't really there in a certain sentence. For example, uh, if you have a noun, Mary, then you might say, well, Mary is a female, or a male, or an it. And then that would be, when translating between different languages, maybe in some languages you don't say, say that Mary is an it, mm -hmm. but it's, you know, in that language, it's, it's, it's applied, implied, sorry. But when you would translate back to a different language, then you would add the she, or the it. Yes, that's, that's how it's supposed to be done. Because um, actually, if you translate from English to German, German has a different system. Um, a girl is it normally. Um, a cherry is female. So you have to be really careful if you translate that. Um, which means you have to do the analysis. What does the, the she and the it refer to in English? And con uh, take that information and, and move it to your target language and then figure out in the target language, okay, so I need a pronoun that refers to this word. What does it have to look like in German or in Italian or whatever? Um, unfortunately, that does not really agree with the, the statistical machine learning, uh, sorry, machine translation approach that's the most um, su successful at the moment. Um, if you try to integrate that kind of information into the statistical analysis, um, normally the system is so bad that nobody tried to touch that. But yeah, that, that's the way we should go. And that's what actually what, what people originally did um, in these deep systems where they did the, the linguistic analysis and then did some kind of transfer in, into the target language and then tried to generate the sentence. That didn't work all that well because most of the, the stuff was handwritten. And so you can cover the sentences that you looked at when you developed your, your rules, but then along comes the next sentence and that you haven't seen so far, and then there's something in there that you just hadn't thought about, and then it, it goes wrong. So we have to be more robust than the original manually written rules, um, but we have to have more information than what the statistics provides us. I do have one question. Oops. I, I do have one question. In terms of, uh, hmm, is this working? Yeah. Uh, in, in terms of uh, the, uh, uh, the translation of the system, uh, do people from, for, from, uh, for a layman like me, in, uh, in so far as linguistics is concerned, uh, it, it seems to me that you can actually have a constraint, you can have sort of a, an additional constraint in your system so that you can improve your performance in the sense where I think some of the sentences, for instance, that you, uh, you know, that you noted and in some cases got some funny translations and things, it seems to me that if you define the context in which, you know, in which whatever, whatever translation, uh, your translation took place in, mm -hmm. then uh, you can actually improve your performance uh, significantly, isn't it? Yes, if you know the domain, I think my mind is switched off. If you know the domain um, in which you're translating, um, you know that this is the financial news, um, then it, certain words have certain meanings, so you can use that information. Um, but if you think about Google Translate, Google Translate doesn't know that. If you type in a sentence out of the blue, it has to do something with it. Um, and additionally, we don't have enough data to train domain specifically. Um, so again, that would say, well, we would require a module saying this is financial domain, this is biology, um, this is, I don't know, literature, whatever. Um, we don't have that. Uh, translators, uh, they, they tell you uh, at the supermarket, at the pharmacy, and things like that. <laughs> most, most of the time they get it actually pretty, pretty well. Any other questions? 